Okay, hello everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for our leadership, uh, our, our webinar on active leadership um, this morning. We have an amazing set of um, experts and industry representatives uh, speaking about this important topic, which has been made uh, exceptionally uh, important and clearly important to everyone uh, by uh, the months, the challenging months, the months that we've just uh, moved through with uh, COVID-19 and us uh, moving into the post-COVID-19 um, world and this, the special um, circumstances that that will uh, present to our sector. We have with us this morning um, Jennifer from uh, BasicFit, who's also on the board of Europe Active. We have Miguel from uh, IESA Business School. Um, Alan McFarlane, also uh, from uh, IESA Business School, and he's an executive coach, um, working uh, freelance for our sector and many other sectors. Certainly an expert in management. And we have Steve, Steve Scales from um, UK Active, who's also an alumni of the Future Leaders program, which, um, which has been run uh, by UK Active and IESA Business School, and uh, in which program uh, Miguel and Alan uh, have been teachers for uh, many years. I'm sure you'll see much more about that uh, in, in, in the webinar. Um, in uh, the recent uh, strategy paper that Europe Active released, we've defined um, leadership skills and management skills for our sector as a very high priority um, for the post-COVID-19 um, world. You can find our strategy paper on uh, europeactive.eu, but we really define um, um, great leadership for our sector as one of the major strategic priorities uh, in the coming years. It's up there with digitalization and uh, aligning our sector with, uh, with public health um, and being providers of physical, social, and mental well-being. So it's really a high priority of ours. And, and for that reason, we're really excited to have um, our set of experts with us today to speak about leadership for our sector. And, and also um, that we have a partnership with UK Active coming up, which we will say much more about in the coming weeks and, uh, and, and months in terms of, um, in terms of uh, giving our sector an opportunity to, uh, to really upskill in terms of um, leadership. We'll come back to that. Uh, but without uh, further ado, I'll hand over to um, to Alan. Well, I think we might be going to Miguel. Miguel, sorry, sorry. So uh, we start uh, then. Uh, if I can share screen, uh, Rob. Yeah, you just need to activate it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, got it. Great. Uh, okay, is it on? Yes. All right, so uh, good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Alan, thanks for the invitation. Steven, Jennifer, Alan, this is a great pleasure to share a table with you. Uh, uh, we're going to be here this morning, and, and we're going to be splitting the presentation in the way that I'm going to be talking about a strategy, and uh, Alan's going to be talking more about leadership, and then we have the benefit of having two experts in the field, like uh, Steven and Jennifer. So and uh, we'll have this uh, first part of the session. And then uh, at the end of our, uh, you know, on our time, we'll open for Q&A and we invite all of you to put your questions, to start writing your questions in the chat box. And then Jennifer is gonna be coordinating and reading the questions and leading the, the, the questions to the people that she believes that can give the best answer for that. So. Uh, good morning again, and uh, technology continues amazing me. You know, I have to think that more than 100 or 150 people we are uh, connected now, and uh, it's uh, it's fantastic. We do uh, we can do that. Well, I see now 55 people here on the, on the screen. So um, let's start talking about a strategy. So um, uh, by the way, you have uh, digital copies of this presentation. So you don't need to to take pictures. You feel like uh, whatever you feel like, but the, you you have digital copy that will, you know, the the, the team will pass uh, over you. All right. So um, as uh, Alan was introducing, I'm a professor at the SA Business School. We have been having the benefit of having the Future Leaders Program there with uh, UK Active. With uh, I have nothing but good memories about it. Great group of people, very exciting, and people committed to grow the sector and understanding next steps to be taken to be a successful uh, group. And uh, myself, I'm, uh, I've been a professor there in ESA for 10 years. And uh, before that, I was an executive for different companies like PepsiCo or Sara Lee and in, in Europe and in the United States. 
And I remember when I started delivering sessions at the ESA and I was trying to, uh, I was uh, imagining a professor at the ESA delivering sessions to the banking industry, fitness industry, uh, technology industry, consulting, you name it. And uh, sometimes I, I was thinking, how come I can dare to, 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 to talk in front of people that they know more about their sector than I do? So how much do I have to know to be, uh, to, to have the, the, the right to speak in front of them? And then I found this thought from Socrates that I like very much, and I'm sharing it with you, that it's, I cannot teach anybody anything. I can only make them think. And then, you know, I found my, my cup of tea in a way, say, yeah, maybe I cannot, in that case, not so much about your sector, but certainly I can, uh, I, I can make you think. I can, we can think together about uh, what we can do for the future. So this session, this morning, I invite you to think and to reflect about it, take notes and, and, and think about it because these are you know, kind of islands in the middle of the ocean that you know, we have from our day-to-day -day activity. And it's a luxury for all of us to have uh, the benefit of having this is a certain amount of time to think about it, okay? So let's go for the session. So uh, certainly we're, we've been facing, or we're facing, and depends on the country, because I was uh, talking to people in Peru and Brazil, and they're having a hard time over there, people in New York, and certainly Spain, it looks like it's getting better, but this morning, because of the openings now, we have to be more careful. So uh, you've heard in the, in the newspapers about uh, people, you know, allowing to cross some borders, but you have to do the quarantine. So you have dark clouds, certainly, but you know, my, 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 my thing is that certainly there's a light at the end of the tunnel and we have to learn a lot about, it, okay? So certainly we have a lot of uncertainty. It's complex, it's not defined timeline. It's gonna last six months, three months, uh, I would, until the vaccine comes out, and it's global. It's something that's happening all over the world at the same time in different, you know, stages. But it's it's going that way. So certainly, it's it's something that we are all in that, all right? So it's I think it's a, the reflection. It, it's it's gonna be useful for all of us at the same time. Uh, so I've organized uh, this part of the session with uh, this, uh, what I call the, this strategy thought process that, you know, during the, the quarantine, because you, you are more time than expected at home, you start thinking about uh, different things. And I, I, I in a way, I, I, I put this acronym together, LIFE, because I think it's, you know, it's what we want to do, to go live. And I define that as the key drivers for a new world. And it, it talk about leadership, immediacy, future, and digital. And even though the leadership uh, part is going to be uh, uh, touched profoundly by Alan, just let me, let me make a couple of pins about that. So let's go for the presentation, in my, in my case, for this order, the life, the leadership, immediacy, future, and digital. Uh, first of all, you, you know, this is a picture of New York City, as, as, as you can see, and, and you know, and I like to have the picture of the city that they're having a hard time, or, you know, it's, it's getting better, but it's still there. And uh, I spent a couple of years of my life in, the, in, in New York, so that's why I, I like to, to refer to the city that I admire a lot. So the first thing about leadership, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, a general aspect, I think it's a, it's a matter of mindset and the manners. And I said, Alan will be going more in depth in, in, in the concepts that he thinks that it's going to, are going to be useful for that, for us. But mindset is very important. What kind of mindset we're having a, 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 in front of a difficult situation or a challenging situation? Uh, are we are more problem solvers or are we are, are we are part of the solution or a part of the problem? That's a, that's a decision. You know, it's a, it's a it's a uh, it's a decision we have to make. We want we are more thinking about possibilities or thinking more about limitation. And what I like about uh, you know New York City, you can see here the Freedom Tower is that place where the Twin Towers were, where before they were collapsing in two thousand and one. And I would like to share you a, a feeling that I got at that time. I was working for a multinational uh, in the United States and I was flying from Barcelona to where I'm based, uh, currently based, to, to New York, uh, you know, once, uh, once a month. And I remember the, the trip on September 11 was canceled because of the collapse of the Twin Towers. And then I was flying there on October 11, October 11, 2001. So one month later after, the, you know, the Twin Towers uh, fact. 
And I remember getting into New York City and these uh, guys, for those that have been there, you know, these tough policemen there waiting for you, not the, the nicest people in the world. And I remember that the, that big guy telling me, thanks for coming back. And I remember that, that sense like now. So because we have to think at that time was kind of challenging what, what was going on with the world, what was going to be going with, uh, with uh, New York City. And my, my conclusion, my reading 10 or so many years, almost 20 years later after that, is that, you know, these guys built the Freedom Tower, were able to get back to, to business. So this is the kind, the kind of mindset I think that we, sh we all should have. You know, it's not so much thinking about the past because the life is not about going to the past, it's about going forward. So I like to, this spirit about, you know, the Freedom Tower, about mindset, about rebuilding. It's not just reopening, it's rebuilding, it's doing new things. It's about uh, a new, a smarter model, a model for our businesses, for our cities, for our, uh, our countries. So mindset is my point about leadership. Uh, the guy on the left side, you know him. The guy on the right side is, uh, is Alessandro Campagna. And he's the, he's the uh, coach of the national team of water polo in, in Italy. And they made it the, the World Cup in the last edition. And I was with him just, you can see the date here. It's a one year ago, July 2019 in Bologna. And I remember we shared, you know, uh, we were the speakers at a conference. And one of the questions that he was asked was, uh, uh, Alessandro, when you pick people for your team, what kind of people you, you pick? I said, well, I have the benefit of having very good players in Italy. So it's, it's challenging. But if I had to choose one characteristic for the guys that have to be in the first team are the guys that are able to play under, uh, under pressure. Because it's relatively easy to be a you know, very good player at the first part on the first games of the championship. But it, when it comes to the, five, the last five minutes of the final game where you can make it or you cannot make it, then you see the difference. I mean, those, then the abilities, you know, people get a stress sometimes and they don't, don't want to take the responsibility. Crisis get the best from us and sometimes the worst from us. So the ability to pick the right people to, to support that stress is what I'm now placing to the business part of the world. I mean, among your teams, among yourself, how good are you at uh, supporting the stress? of not having, uh, you know, a clear north or not having, you know, we have to take the responsibility. It's a great opportunity among your team to pick up those people that really are very good at these last five minutes of the game. So I think it's a great opportunity for first to know yourself and to know your people. And you can discover people that you can rely more on because, you know, maybe more things like this will come in the future, but that's life. Life is uncertainty. Business is uncertainty. Nothing is certain. Sometimes the sales go up. Sometimes the revenues go down. Uh, so it's about, it's about reflecting. It's about not just taking the things that it happened. It's making things happen. So being able to handle the pressure, I think, is a great ability for sport people like most of you are and for business people as most of you are. Um, I like very much this picture and, and because the message I want to send here is that you gotta love your business. I mean, we like you. I, we, we like you. You know, the, the 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 people in the gym or in the fitness or in whatever world you want to be. I mean, I like you. I like my sport. It's like in in football. I'm a great supporter of football club Barcelona, and that's not having the best time in the world. But it will come back. Don't worry, it will come back. But if we talk about Liverpool or any uh, any or Manchester City, any one of these uh, teams are doing uh, very good. I mean. You gotta love the ball. If you don't love the ball, I mean, you don't. I mean, you you don't like you. You gotta love what you do, because the ball is a risk and it's an opportunity. You score, you are on top of the world. You fail, you are on the bottom of the world. So, I mean, but it's part of life. I mean, this this uncertainty. I know that sometimes it stresses out a lot, has a lot, but it, it's part of the world. But at the bottom, I'm out of here, we like you, but we have to like economics and financials. It's not good enough knowing about the business. We are in business. We have to understand the economics of our 
business, big or small, and the financials. Financials to fund that while maybe you know, the revenues are down because of the current situation and the economics, understanding, you know, how many costs I have, how many revenues I have, and, and understand that. So it's my message to you that it's very important to very good, be very good and love the business you're in, but we have to be able to manage that. And if we are not good at this, we have to ask for support or to learn. So the learning, when we're talking about life learning, you know, journey, it's because of that, you know, we have to get to know things that we love and maybe spontaneously do very good. But at the same time, if we are in business, we are responsible for the people we have. We're responsible for the different costs we're having and understanding the dynamics of business. It's very important. So let's not forget about it. I've, I've seen very creative people that they need somebody that, you know, help them to, to, to understand which things they have to control and to read and to, 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 to understand, as I'm putting here, economics and financials. So this idea, what, uh, you know, Alan was mentioning about getting involved with uh, training or uh, education, it's, it's something that we all need. We all need help. Me first, and it's okay. We are not here in this world to go by ourselves. So getting support from any, a, a, anywhere we can get it, it's, it's a good news. All right, so enough about leadership, Alan. I'm looking forward to listening to you about leadership. And let's go for immediacy. Of course, immediacy, there are many things. Now we have had, you know, this uh, confinement situation. And we have the benefit in the world of having companies like McKinsey Company and, and many other consulting firms that they share their knowledge with all of us to, to give us guidance on what to do. And I like it very much this summary they made. In immediacy, it's about first, the workforce, how are they doing, health, you know, we have to protect them. So pay attention to them. Then supply chain, depends on the business we are in. Imagine a supermarket chain, we have, uh, we have to have suppliers for my fruit and vegetables and meat and so forth, and then getting open for the consumers and make them that it's safe, safe for them to come to my stores. Customers, so in, in terms of your business, understanding the customers now, uh, they were at home, uh, we'll see what happened, the different things. Financial stress, understand the financial stress. How much money do we have? And certainly cash is key. Cash is key. The more, the, the more cash I have, the more I can sustain my business for a certain period of time where I may, maybe my revenues are not going to be that good. If my revenues are low, my costs have to be low. So I have to make decisions. So decision making under pressure is one of the, reason, one of the things we have to do. And I like very much the fifth point as well. We're talking about operating nerve. It's, it's calling, we have, when in crisis, it's very, it's very important to have very, very frequent connection with people because we have more doubts, we feel more insecure. So this nerve, and I like because the word nerve in terms of comedy or commission, you know, sends me a message of, you know, positive tension to, come on, I'm here to take ownership of the situation and I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do my best to get things happening in my favor. Uh, it's time to support. It's time to support people. It's time to support people. We understand there are people that are having a hard, very hard time. So we have to take care. First, we have to care of ourselves, health, economically and everything and cooperation. So I, I, I like the thought about thinking if, if, a, if a sector is not doing well, if, uh, if my company does well in a sector that's not doing well, I'm not that doing that well. So I'm part of the sector. You know, I like very much now it's not so much about individuals. It's about, you know, communities. It's not so much about, uh, you know, uh, if I may, uh, countries. It's about humanity. So anything that we can do as a sector, in whatever sector we are, to reinforce, you know, the value that the service, the sector is delivering to the market, it's good. So now it's not just going by ourselves trying to do and, you know, just picking, you know, consumers or, you know, customers from others. Come on, it's something, building a better sector for all of us. Let's go for, for the future. My message here is that, the future, even though we are uh, firefighting many things today, but it's good that during the week we find, you know, two hours, three hours to think about the future. We cannot just wait to, uh, to, to think about the future until the future arrives. We have to do it now, today, already, you know, a couple of hours. How does it look like? And what's going to happen? Which, which things will change? Which things will not change? 
which things I'm going to be changing, what, what I learned from my experience that I should be, be doing different, different. So let me go for that. Uh, then certainly it will be a day after. Maybe some of you are already in the day after. So, and we're going to we have many shifts in many fronts, right? So human behaviors, industry dynamics, technology, regulation, macroeconomic, geopolitics. By the way, sectors in the past were just people doing the same thing in a way. Now there's an evolution. It's not so much about sectors, about ecosystems. Because in our world, in, in the fitness world, you know, there's technology invading that or helping us to be better, you know, better businesses over there. So understanding all these things, these ecosystems will help us to be better. By the way, here I put on the right side, you know, a sentence from Larry Page, the founder of Google. They, they, he says, let's not miss the future. The future. So think about it. Think, you know, we are all in the same line now. Think about how it's going to be. All right. So that's uh, I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts about that. Then we have the benefit of having many companies said like McKinsey, this Euro Monitor International. Look, I checked the global consumer trends 2019, not refer to your industry. The refer to your industry will come in the next slide. But see the 10 tendency, the trends. Look at this. People wanted to be, before the coronavirus, age agnostic. We want to be young as long as possible. Ba back to basics for a status, conscious consumer, digitally together. Uh, and then everyone's an expert. We want to see how many people is doing gym classes, you know, with that, you know, that my knowledge for me, just because they are influencers and they are online and maybe they have 10,000, 15,000 people just following them, you know, because, you know, we, we all think that we are an expert. Finding my Jomo, joy of missing out, people staying home more than ever. I can look after myself, I want plastic free world, I want it now, load nursing. So one thing that I recommend all of us, me first and to you too, pay attention to those companies and maybe you can get into internet or you can use a, you, you're at the active team, you know, to understand how, how, where, where the world is heading to. So we see that we have got more senior people, want to be young, so probably having more activity, I have to pay attention to them. So uh, people, people will stay in home more times, maybe home office will take, I mean, that's the information. Then it's, it's you, it's us to making our best predictions about the world, how it's going to be. For instance, digitally together, how many people riding bicycle? My son was riding a bicycle and said, I won. But I, I told him I was, go you were going alone. Yeah, but I was competing with 100 people that did that route before. So understanding that is very important. Pay attention about the future. And this is about the, the fitness global trends based on the information from Health and Business Journal for 2020. See, you have it. Remember, you have digital copies of that. But these guys are talking about wearable technology. So if wearable technology is there, we have to understand how can we use that technology in our favor or what my customers are expecting from this technology. Probably they want more information, maybe apps for, my, you know, my, for the business I'm offering high intensity interval, uh, uh, interval training, group training, so forth. Here you have a different list. I mean, it's not the least important. The important thing is that you pay attention to what other people, other people are saying about global terms because you are gonna be in a better position to make decisions about where to focus for to grow to, you, to, your, to your business. And one of the things I've seen you know, in the, all over the world, I'm, I'm, I have the benefit of uh, having many uh, content in many businesses all over the world, but people centric. And I'm talking, I'm not talking about customer centric. I think the world is going to be people centric. It's not customers, it's not patient, it's not consumers, people, our people, our employees, ourselves, our family, you know, customers, all of them are people. So, you know, and people are, it's about, you know, feelings, it's about emotions, it's about rational from time to time. So understand, and the more we understand about consumers or our people that are related to our world, the better, because we are obliged in a way to make life of people easier, you know, to give the kind of service, the kind of values they need, they look for. So, and uh, there are many things we can do, uh, certainly. Uh, so for instance, here, a couple of reflections about it. And who am I? You know, I'm in the health, I mean, the physical activity and the fitness, that's uh, an answer you have to answer for yourself. 
And then I wrote here, where do I deliver value for customers? Intangibles, intangibles. I'm a site, I'm a gym, or I'm a brand. You know, it's, it's, uh, now people are not coming to my gyms or not as much as they were coming in the past. What will happen in the future? And, and then the, my reflection yesterday, because I was excited about this, uh, this uh, session, is that I, I organize that offline and online. Offline, they come to you. They come to your place. To, you open the door and they come there. You gym, brick and mortar. It's local. It's your neighborhood. So, so certainly. And then the kind of trainer you have, for instance, it's, you know, it's a person that has to face-to-face, -to -face, uh, you know, uh, a relationship with uh, the people. But then we go to the online line. It's online as you go to them. It's not them coming to you. Of course, they can come to you if you have an app and so forth. But, you know, what's going to happen with the home? With home, will people train more from home or will come to the gym? Or maybe from the office or maybe from the schools or maybe global. You may have, you know, uh, you know, train people that are in Australia or are in, in, in Peru or are in Spain because you are a great, great, you know, company there. So maybe the training profile is different. Maybe the training profile for person to person is what? Uh, profile on, 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 on on online is different. The same with professors of business school. It's not the same doing face-to-face -face sessions that doing these online sessions. And then I was saying, well, what about outdoors? Because I was thinking, well, the gym or home, no, or anywhere, anywhere is outdoors at the same time. So people, maybe they want to spend more time outdoors and nature and city. I'm not gonna be there. I'm just, in a way, let me be a very drastic. I'm gonna be waiting in my gym for people to come and then complain about people not coming. Come on, you can go to the world. I mean, let's see what we can do with that, you know. So this, this, uh, that's why these two questions I put here, how, who am I, in which fields I want to deliver my, my value, and where do I deliver value for customers, I think is very important. Sometimes it's a tangible is the most important thing, let me tell you, in businesses, intangible is the most, most important thing. Because tangibles you can copy. I can build a gym tomorrow if I have money. But the intangible, the spirit, the emotion, I uh, know it's, it's different. And let's go for it. And it is very simple. It's digital, digital. I mean, let's embrace technology fast. You can be the best sport people in the world, the best trainer, the best fitness center in the world, but we are not gonna be nobody if we don't have digital in our world. E-commerce, e-learning, e-coaching, e-games, you know, e e and then see how you apply the e-health. So certainly people just don't want to be in good shape. They want to be healthy and they want to uh, uh, play games. And, you know, so, you know, it's, it's very important. We all embrace technology. So I'm sure that we are not at 1% of the level of technology uh, level that we are going to be having in 10 years from now. So the future has come very fast. You know, now we are talking here in Zoom. You know, we never thought that we were going to be like this in three months ago. So future, what was going to take in 10 years, just took in a few days. So let's take advantage of that and let's get in this um, digital and let's learn about that. I have, I'm the first one to learn about that. You go for that because they, they are providing, many companies are providing us with very, very good tools just to, to, to be better for our business. So let's go live. Let's go live. Build a better business. I, I picked the picture of that lady because we are all with masks. But look, see, you, we can smile with even with a sm mask on our face. I mean, it, and it's part of our life. I mean, we have to be optimists in terms that we have to think and expect and work to have a better world that, you know, we've been facing all these months and understanding, learning, you know, and, and educating for to having a better future for all of us. So I invite you to go live. Having said that, uh, let me uh, pass the floor to stop sharing here and pass the floor to Alan for to learn from uh, about leadership. Hello, everyone. It's uh, Alan McFarland here. Delighted to be with you. Um, I mean, just a quick bio for myself. Uh, my life has been a, a change story in itself. I started off as a a commercial litigation partner in Edinburgh, in Scotland, my home country. Before doing my MBA at the SE at Business School, so that association started 30 years ago. And then I had a, a long a global career in a leading FMCG company, designing and implementing strategic initiatives in different parts of the world and living uh, excitingly in different places, including Brazil and Hungary and London and, and France and, and Spain and Portugal. 
Um, and, and then I moved on to be uh, independent, uh, collaborating very closely with Yesi through our previous connection on the Executive Coaching Fund and what we call Action Learning. And that's really where I became uh, close to the whole uh, fitness activity sector um, through being uh, in charge of and leading their Executive Challenge section of their UK Active Future Leading Leaders program, uh, along with Mikhail. Um, and, and the other uh, area that I've, I've really become a big focus on, and I'm going to be sharing it with you, and I think it's, it's pretty fundamental part of any leader's uh, portfolio of knowledge, is to really understand uh, what we mean by fundamental human characteristics. Uh, again, I'll talk about knowing ourselves, really knowing ourselves, our fundamentals, and how we can apply those uh, in, in the occupational space, in the workplace. It's, it's a developing field, it's, it's moving forward, and I think uh, we can share some leading edge information and ways of, ways of looking at that. So I'm going to be dovetailing a bit with uh, Mikhail's piece, certainly as a piece around about the L of, of life, but you know, clearly leadership and leadership interventions and the way we do them well or otherwise underpin you know, the immediacy section, the underpin the future section, and the underpin our ability to craft and move forward with the, the E section. So it, it really, really goes, goes through it all. And in, and in thinking about this, um, I understand there's been a kind of reframing from future leaders to active leaders. I love the word active leaders. And, and I just add one letter to it at the end, uh, because it also for me, for me means activated leaders. Uh, what does that transfer or translate into? It means maximize. It means leaders who are firing on all cylinders. It means that they are doing what comes to them naturally, fantastically well. They are absolutely applying themselves in the best way possible in whatever context they're in. And to the extent that sometimes there's not a great match between what they have to do and the way they are, then how can they partner with people or tactically uh, do things uh, in order to be uh, as effective as possible? And so we're all complex um, uh, people. We've all got our own particular mix of fundamental human characteristics. There is no good or bad, right or wrong in any of this. But when you look at different contexts in which we operate in as leaders, individually and collectively as a, as a leadership team, as many as you, as you do, then you may have individual or collective signals of strength, which means you're really, really well placed by the way you are to, to hit on the nail certain interventions you have to make. In different contexts, or sometimes you might be individually or collectively challenged. Might be a gap. This is a gap. What do you do about it? And, and the three uh, contexts, which I'll be touching on the, the, the last two more fully. Clearly, this is the old norm. You know, it, it, it ain't going to come back. But the old way it was, and we would have certain uh, ways and strengths and signals and watchings because of where we were in in that many. Many things that served as well served as well, but they may not serve as, as well in the other context, which is the crisis context. Hopefully, uh, it's peaked and we're coming through it into the, the third context, and that's leading into the, the new norm, the new normal. What is it that leaders really need to do, and how can they do that super well, being the way they are and really understanding the way they are? So that that's the 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 the, 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 the kind of. Uh, underpinning. I'm going to look at three levels uh, and, and Rob if you could pop me onto the, the next slide it'd be great. You know, I'm going to be dealing with purpose, um, the, 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 the why, the impact of, of the, the company's activities. But clearly to deliver a purpose you need to be very clear granularly, specifically, what is it we actually have to do collectively to deliver that purpose. It gets down to those basics. And then the foundation, well if that's the set of activities we have to do, who best is, is can do these things. Uh, is it me, all me? Do I need to partner with someone? Do we need to allocate uh, throughout the, the leadership team in order that we're covering all the bases necessary to prosecute our, our agenda fully, depending on the context in which we're, we're in? So um, that's a kind of a, a framework or, or of the levels I'm going to deal with. And if we pop on to, to purpose. You know, that first line there, what is it? Well, it's the enduring reason uh, for the existence of the company beyond the profit, profit motive. Um, and I'm sure many of you on, on the call today are their shareholders and, and, and profit is, is important. But if, if that's what it's all about, if that's the end of it, that's the only so what, 
then there's a real risk that your, your, your company will uh, not uh, be sustainable in the long term, and certainly not from the point of view of um, attracting, motivating, retaining uh, key employees who, who become the, the motor to drive it forward. So, so it, it's important to, to, why are we here? Why do I do my job? What's the so what? What's the impact of, of what we do? And, and then it, there's, there's very clear evidence that when a leader, when leaders as, as the main uh, exec group authentically believe in that purpose, when they, when they uh, internalize it, when they absolutely believe it, when they, it ties in to, to, to what we call saying, when they love it, love their business, but love the purpose, be determined and motivated, lit up by it, when they're lit up by the purpose, and then they connect people to it, uh, then, then you create this great collective uh, power to, to move the company forward. And that always uh, uh, results in great motivation and great performance. And it's especially important in, in these days of employee choice. Now, employee choice might be less of it. Maybe, maybe are people more fearful about moving, but there's lots of movement in the labor market. There is choice. We're lucky enough to have choice. And, and certainly the first world war, come, uh, world that we live in, perhaps we touched into the second world in, in different areas, but employee choice is there. And, and therefore to provide them a real purpose, a real meaning, a real reason to, to take, to, to be with us and to put in that discretionary effort is, is, is vital. And, and I, I would just maybe expand a little bit. And this is, to be honest, this is where Andreas and I, I think, uh, connected when we, we first met in, in, in Madrid last year. And, and, and it's this understanding or, or awareness that you know, human beings, we are unique in a, as a species in seeking meaning in what we do. We, we, we need it, we look for it, we, we're incessant. And when we have it, then it helps us survive even the most existential crisis that we can face. Um, Andreas, I know, is, is an admirer, as I am, of Viktor Frankl, who was the philosopher, uh, writer, who, who, whose finding of meaning in Auschwitz concentration camp allowed him to survive and overcome, help people in his own way. And, and for me, for us, it's an inspiration on how when we base ourselves in meaning and purpose, then it's our shining light to see us through whatever existential crisis it can be. And that can be through different lines. It can be the individual one. Uh, you know, where, where's the paycheck? I'm, I'm going to pay the, 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 the mortgage or the rent, or I'm going to pay the, the, the kids whatever the kids need. Or it can be the company. Well, goodness, we really are. Are we going to open up again? Are we going to get the, the, the people? Are we going to get enough funds on, on machines to, to, to whatever? Uh, or the whole sector can be, can be shaking. So, Having purpose, I'm, I'm, I'm close to a senior Nike, Nike, Nike um, executive, and when we were talking about the last economic crisis, you know, the question was, you know, how did you survive? And he said just directly, it all came back to purpose. We went back to our purpose, and our purpose was the thing that drove us through. So I'd encourage you to, to, to explore the purpose, the why, uh, the so what. I'm going to bring it to life uh, uh, quickly. Um, I, I did, uh, uh, with, with the next slide, uh, Rob, if you, if you may, uh, I did work uh, with, with uh, as a CEO, it, it, a breakout company, gas installation, as you can see, uh, in, in the Gulf region. Um, and we, we started talking, well, what's the so what of, of your, why do you do your role? Well, I do the role, I'm a CEO. Well, what's the so what of being so CEO? Well, it's because I, um, I can determine exactly how we're going to do things. I, I want that, I want that. Uh, ability to influence the, the, the delivery and the, the quality of our, our approach. And what's the so what of that? Well, happy clients. Well, what's the so what of the happy clients? Well, they can they can operate, you know, because they were certifying these gas installations. Uh, they were, can operate. They can they can. Um, um, well, what's the what's the co partner of that? Well, they operate safely. He said, and he he was having problems in retaining people because. People, uh, you know, gas inspector installation certifiers are not the most welcome people. They're not the most popular. They come along with a checklist and tell you to do this and that. Uh, it, it can be pretty tough. And so people are often inclined to, to go for the money. Uh, so he was really looking for a purpose. I said, okay, you operate safely. Well, what's the, what's the consequence of operating safely? Well, the clients make money. What's the other consequence? Well, uh, there's, there's no accidents. 
so what's the core fault of there being no accidents? And, and then there was a pause. And, and, and I'm sure we're only on, on audio, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure I heard a catch in his throat. So sometimes my mind doesn't telling it. He said, the so what of no accidents is that kids smile when their fathers come home safe every night. That's why uh, we do our job, for kids to smile. And, and if you pop on the next slide, this is what he took to his workforce. This is the, the beacon, uh, the smile, which uh, allowed the people who were working really hard and accounts payable when the whole pile up and backlog to keep on going because they knew if they could clear it, perhaps a quick quicker, then it will all help the, the smiles take, uh, become reality. And when perhaps their, their inspectors got a, a, a gruff, gruff response from someone who said, oh gosh, do I really have to do that? Can't you come? Then, then it kept them going. Uh, it's all about making kids smile. So that's an example. And I encourage you to go to the so what. Um, you know, looking at the, the strategy paper, Year of Active, you know, there's a mission there. It's a great mission being the leading voice of uh, fitness and activity in Europe. Then I put the further chat, what's the so what of that? What flows from being a leading voice? Um, in some of the, 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 the Be Active Hour piece, there's this talk about immunity and community. Uh, you know, those, those words tie together so nicely with the, 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 the rhythm of it, and the rhyming of it. Is there a purpose in there? You know, increasing the resilience of, of the average uh, population in, to face the next uh, pandemic in, in better conditions. So I'd leave you with that to, to really explore, if you don't have it, uh, explore what your purpose might be, to work through to the chain of the so what, and then, you know, use it to really connect your people, to drive your, 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 your company, company forward, no matter, no matter the threat. So, next slide, please, uh, Rob. I'm going to touch on um, crisis, um, leadership in crisis, and, and I, I would frame it all about, and it's very consistent, I think, to what Kel was saying, you know, it's all about issue and, and risk management, because the crisis is upon you. Uh, there's there's a, a definition, if you like, of a, a significant disruption. Uh, you know, people's frame of reference is, is really shaken. Uh, there's a loss of control. There's uncertainty about, and fear, and particularly about the duration and will the new world ever return? And will I have any ability to operate and live and make, make a living in it? So these, these are very, very real. And it's all about uh, getting a hold of the situation. Uh, Andreas uh, told me that, you know, he and Dave, when it first broke from your active, they, then the metaphor was almost the pilots of a plane and suddenly there's this great electric storm and it's wobbling and it's shaking and the sparks and whatever it is, and there's a, a need withstanding the pressure to, 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 to Mikhail's point, I need to be the backbone, the, the cam pilot to take this ship, this craft safely through and land it safely. Yeah. And, and so you can see the kind of interventions that are primary. And I'm, I'm sharing this in a point of view, you may still be needing to do these things. You may still have, you may have done them, but it's good to record them because you're going to have to perhaps uh, do them again when the next crisis hits and prepare for it, not be taken as much by surprise. So there's issue, there's fact focus, there's, but there's also a lot of helping employees, there's the emotional care and support, there's the people's centricity, which Mikhail also talked about, helping through the emotional ups and downs, responding, understanding, legitimizing, not personalizing. Uh, any behavioral dysfunctionality that, that might be coming through. You know, the need to, uh, everyone I've heard speaking about leaders in crisis at the moment, I've talked about communicate, 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 over communicate, communicate even when there's nothing to communicate. You know, speak out often, so frequency, which I've, I've highlighted there, unequivocally, i.e. tell it as it is, you know, you can't sugarcoat some of this stuff, but in that telling, do it sensitively. Uh, now, to do all that, I'm going to say, requires a certain kind of person. To do all that really well requires a certain kind of personality. We'll come back to that in a minute. Show employees that they are appreciated and things are taken seriously and build this confidence. Who's sharing and doing what you're doing that you really understand and are controlling and that already you're alive and looking out for the, the new unknowns that might just go around the corner and could complicate this crisis even more. Yeah. 
Now, what I would say is that that's a, a broad range. It's a, I would say it's a great range list of things. You, you, you may have more, uh, but it's certainly it's, it's a core of things there. But to do all those things super well, you know, it requires superman, superwoman, rubber man, rubber woman. You need to have a whole range of characteristics, a whole range of naturally produced behaviors to do all of it really well. And if you're just knowing yourself, uh, it may be that if you have a fact focus that's really part of your way of being, some people are really fact focused, analytical objective, and it's great for issue resolution uh, and, and the risk identification, especially if you have a vigilance energy around about vigilance. Uh, it, it may be, that, but we're also looking for people who really are deeply caring and empathetic and provide the care and support for other people. And, and those are other aspects, and not everyone has both. Some are lucky enough to be able to stretch, but most people are preference one way or the other. And just being aware of it and knowing where you can lever your strength or where you might want to pull in some partnership or dial yourself up uh, would, would be interesting. We'll, we'll press on uh, with the next one, Rob. Thanks very much. So the new normal leadership, and hopefully, and, and I think it, sounds as if everyone in the sector probably on the calls is moving, beginning to, to come out. And I'd characterize it by uh, looking at emerging opportunities and how to take advantage of those. But you know, they'd have to be, to be explored, they need to be identified, they need to be assessed, they prioritized, and then exploited fully. And so there's a perhaps a, a shift in the, in the focus of the interventions now. They might be dealing with both contexts, one foot and one Put in the, the new norming. You know, what are the trends? How do you explore? How are you open to? How are you encouraging uh, the, the exploration, the conversation, the agenda points uh, uh, to, to look at the trends, to, to see where the, the, the paradigm shifts may, may, be, may be taking place? Uh, you know, now this paradigm shift, it may be in a sense from this, this fitness to, to, to social and, and mental well being. It, it may be a, 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 a shift from you know, the, the, the sport coaching paradigm to the partnering with public health authorities. It may be the, 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 the digitalization is, is really uh, taking off. Whatever the paradigm shift is, what are they and how open are we as leaders to embrace and encourage our people? You may have some, you may have some exec teams even are together collectively relatively conservative, relatively focused on, on the efficiency of their team, keeping the well-oiled machine going. Well, actually, if no one's coming in to sit, use the well oiled machine, then maybe they're at a disadvantage from fully grasping the, the future. Um, and, and uh, you know, Jennifer, just before we, we started, was talking about, uh, and this is listening to the voice of customer, you know, there's, there's an issue potentially here uh, in, in her experience, emerging experience of, of men beginning to come back in, in greater numbers to the, the, the gym space than, than, than females. So what's all that about? Um, what can, I'm sure Jennifer and her team are doing it, really listening to the voice of those female consumers, female customers, understand why it's not going back and what can, be, what can be done about it. So a whole bunch of stuff, um, which is uh, exploration and uh, establishing new contacts and maybe new trends, new expectations from society about health and uh, pollution and traceability and sustainability as, as we've touched on. Now, I'm going to just move on now, Rob, and, and talk a little bit about what we mean, what's all this about human characteristics and the importance of understanding them. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been using uh, the, the big five factors uh, of, of human personality, and in particular, a, a, a model and assessment tool called B5+. Plus. Uh, it's from Norway, Human Content. The CEO is, is also an ASC alumni, so there's, there's a connection there. Uh, but this is a, a scientific, reliable, and very valid way of understanding who we are. And factors one and two, together, top left, you can see, is really all about the way we prefer or choose or naturally interact with other people. It can, in factor one, be needing and wanting energy from a lot of contact. Uh, it may, in one, be, well, actually, we're not so needy of that. We take our energy from other places where we're more contemplative, more focused, uh, we can enjoy our own company and we don't need to dominate. Factor two, uh, traditional contrast between people I mentioned earlier who are very, uh, tend to be fact focused. It's not that they don't care for people, but they just care a bit less. They're 
the fact focused analytical objective. You may be a bit like that, you may have others in your team like that, and that will be great for certain things, as we'll see in a minute. But in this factor as well, there's certain things we need to do uh, that, that, that require us to be listening, understanding, legitimize, caring, supporting, allowing for the human touch uh, in, in what we do. So that's the way we interact with people, top left. Top right is more the style of work. You know, personally, do I, through energy, do I naturally go towards wanting planfulness, rigor, systemization, control? There's lots of stuff that benefit from that. Or am I more flexible, more able to change plan, less tied to things, can live with chaos, can live with ambiguity, can live with unexpected bit better, and in fact, push the norms and be a bit more explorative? Coupled with a greater, you know, factor five is all about really bubbling with ideas, really open to, really curious, really embracing of, of, of new norm possibilities. Or sometimes, you know, if people are just naturally more conservative, more state of quo. If they're going to change, it's a bit of a battle. We need to be persuaded by real evidence. And underpinning all this, uh, we've got emotional energy. You know, the amount of which to which uh, emotions come from us, flow from us. It could be positive passion and enthusiasm, it could be frustration and impatience, it could be sudden flares, or it could be a little bit much more calm, uh, distant, relaxed, harder to provoke, uh, actually, right in factor four, um, helps people generally in crisis in terms of keeping calm head and inspiring others, the pilot with the shuddering joystick to get the, 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 the craft down in, in one place. I'm gonna try and bring it to life uh, through some examples in, in the crisis context and then the new norm context, if we, we pop on, Rob. So I'm just going to illustrate here some crisis interventions. We talked about over-communicating. If you are as a leader or you have someone in your leadership team who is on their right in factor one, who really enjoys being out there, visible, talking a lot, interacting without fail, without assessing, without being tired by it, then that kind of human characteristic will really be a signal of strength when it comes to over-communicating in times of crisis. If you happen to be, and you may well be, someone who isn't naturally like that, but much more on, on the left there, then you might have to dial up, you might have to partner with someone, you know, might get help. But through being aware of it, you can uh, um, acknowledge yourself, first of all, then embrace, and that's good, and then exploit the way you are. But if there is a gap, then find, find a, a, an option. If you look at factor two here, you know, people on the left, situation analysis and risk identification, which we said is key, is greatly helped by fact orientation, analysis and objectivity. But you know, at the same time, you've got to look out for, in the same factor, care and support of people, legitimize, understanding, people's centricity, relationship building, alliance building. All that is greatly helped by being right in factor two. Where are you is worth the contemplation, it's worth the, the investigation, it's worth the analysis, then to understand how you can use your signal strength or uh, compensate for them. There, factor four, backbone cam pilot, that's where um, Andres, and it's my sense of him from my interactions with him, and, and uh, more limited interactions with Dave, but I'm sure they were probably helped by having a, a disposition, a natural being, being left in factor four. Some of you, as leaders, may, may be left in factor four, full of enthusiasm and energy, engaging people much more. Well, you, 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 you recognize who you are and play accordingly. And, and if I go to the next one, Andreas, and we're coming to the close, the new normal interventions. You know, I'm gonna highlight bottom right, you know, exploring trends, paradigm shifts, um, changes to strategy or business models, all of that good and necessary stuff we said, uh, looking into the future uh, or embracing digitalization or the paradigm shifts is helped when we have in the leader or in the leadership team someone who's right in four, very open to new ideas, exploring, will take the time to fully, fully analyze and also be very flexible. But having done that bit, we still need someone in the team, hopefully, uh, who will be fact oriented, factor two, because these options have to be evaluated and decided. Now, the difficult decision is you might have to factor two right, build new alliances with public health authorities. That might be quite a different animal. It might be more bureaucratic, it might be slower. Uh, there might be a different kind of stakeholder than, than you've had to deal with in the past. 
And, and far from being calm, which is so necessary, you might be served by deploying and activating people in your team who really have the energy to, to enthuse employees because you know we're coming up a long tunnel. We've got to get people excited about the light and emerging into the light and to operate. And, and so that's an attempt just to, to try and illustrate how, how important it is to know the fundamentals of the way you are and your team is in order to allocate very well to, to the menu of activities which you have to, to do in different contexts. So if we go to the last slide, uh, no, this, is, this is the last slide for me, just as a summary, the purpose, the, 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 the why, the what, the impact, be very clear, living it, believing it authentically, connecting and delivering performance. Activities, well, what is it we do? Be very specific and once you've got, that's the necessary intermediate step in order to then say, well, if that's what we're going to do, who best to do it? Can I do all well? Or do I need to dial up or compensate or partner with in order that we uh, achieve everything fantastic well that we have to do in the different stages that we're passing through? So, with that, I think we're, we're passing on. Uh, if I take the baton and pass it to Jennifer and Stephen, clearly experts uh, in the field, uh, different perspectives, different experiences, real experiences. Um, how, 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 how do you react to what you, you've heard? Uh, what would you add? Have you got examples? Have you got other insights and recommendations from your own experience that can help, uh, help our participants? Um, well, I'm, I'm off mute, so I'll start. Uh, one, of, one of the things that I do uh, at Basic Fit is uh, I spend a lot of time mapping the phases of our customer life cycle, of our customer journeys. Um, and one of the first things that, uh, that I needed to do for, for my own head at the beginning of the, the crisis was to really understand what the, what the phases of the, of the crisis journey um, would be and because uh, we, we're, we're really searching right now that we, we've been able to open our, all of our clubs up to, to, for the opportunity to go back to what was normal to us. But I think that that, that normal is a little bit of a myth and it, it may never come back, but it, it's something that our, that our company is really searching for. Um, but I think it's just it, it, the change has been so constant and everybody has been so uncomfortable in that change and that yucky change phase for so long that there, there's this myth of normal where everything will go back to kind of our automatic pilot, but I don't think that that will ever be. Uh, one of the things that uh, Basic Fit, I think, did really, did really well in the, in the moment of crisis when we, when we knew things had to radically change is there was a crisis management team that was made up of, uh, of our senior managers, operational managers, and executive uh, board um, that really started steering the whole company on a, on a daily basis. Um, we, were, uh, we had launched uh, as an organization, Microsoft Teams and Zoom, uh, with a very moderate level of adoption. Um, in January, but all of a sudden we went to 100% adoption and, and everyone started really, really maximizing those channels. Um, our CEO, Renee Mose, had weekly calls with, uh, with the, the management team to make sure that everybody was informed. And, um, and I think like when I, when I look at, at the, 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 the strength of, of leadership that, that got us through the, the crisis as successfully as we were, we were able to get through. It was the hyper communication that was really um, set forth by the company. I, I can continue talking, but I want to give Stephen a chance to. <laughs> thanks, Jennifer. And thanks, Alan and Miguel as well. It's, it's very rare that I'm on a panel and I've made five pages of my own notes um, coming back from that, I suppose. But to take a, a few reflections and, and learnings from previously is that from a UK active perspective is we were in a fortunate position, this carries on from Dave and Stephen in turn, of the team, the team that we've built and how we evolve it um, based on values. And Miguel mentioned around um, 
loving the industry that you work in and, and the way that I describe it is I suppose three areas ability attitude and how that application um, is provided because at the times of crisis is uh, and especially working remotely um, I'm the only person currently in our office other than our finance director who's watching me at the moment um, is ensuring that we as an executive team and in turn the wider teams in the business we have to be able to trust um, the members of our organization to, to hold the ball and, and to pass the ball and, and have that level of um, autonomy because fundamentally uh, as, as an organization our job is to provide member value as a purpose it's to improve the health of the nation which is ever more important now but that's underpinned by a fertile climate for growth and in order to do that, we need a strong team of people that can listen, that can ask questions, that can challenge how we work to get through it. Um, and from a strategic perspective is, is and to Alan's point around crisis management, is one way that was going to, and will continue to differentiate our sector potentially from others because everyone is in a similar situation. Businesses have been closed, revenues have dropped what sets our sector apart and it's the purpose is that the majority of people work in our sector to improve people's lives first and foremost and capturing that under a united voice which was task number one is bring the sector together forget competition for now as this is about ensuring that the sector has a foundation to grow from and then as, as an organization and, and the, the first thing is we're relatively happy with where it is, but there's always areas of, of, of improvement moving forward and, and, and learning is, is communication through the sector, is asking questions. What are the real challenges? And at the, at the very, very beginning, we produced a strategy that was, that was four points uh, and we ensured that we continued that rhythm and we, we will continue that rhythm through the crisis, looking at operations, how our business is going to be able to adapt, how can we prepare um, the businesses how can we research? How can we learn from where the market began to um, essentially depreciate? Um, and what is it going to potentially look like on the other side? And that's also learning from, from other, other countries. Um, how can we use that united voice to work with government to have that cut through to make sure that um, we have the support, but at the same time, and again, it's, it's, it's work that is ongoing at the moment so that we can open in, in the UK. And then finally and i think this this with that improving the health of the nation um how do we instill consumer confidence regardless of whether that's digital or physical is that we are a a people business and we need to make people feel a um interested in improving their health but be comfortable in whether it's the buildings or the services that we offer that we are going to be able to do that so um i suppose they're the main reflections that i took and I suppose to round all that off is that there were some of the ideas that I'd written down pre-speaking that I've, I've remembered that it was Miguel that said it three years ago as well. So I thought they were my ideas, but yours, Miguel. So congratulations for that. It stuck. Jennifer, you said you had some other, other thanks, Steve. Other, other points? Would you like to share those? Um, yeah, I think... Um, <laughs> like there's so much information I'm just like so many things I want to say uh, I, I think that um, one of one of the one of the things that uh, I, I've really been able to uh, learn over the crisis is because we took the we took the uh, extra step of uh, integrating a corona sentiment questionnaire uh, as, as part of our member reactivation campaign um, and the, the, the answers that we're getting from our customers right now uh, about uh, what they want and what they expect uh, from, their, from their gym or from us as their gym is, is really, really interesting. And, uh, you know, I think we have a lot of assumptions about what people have done over, um, over, the, over the crisis period, but the members who are answering our, our uh, survey on this are saying that 70% of them have been significantly less active over the lockdown. And most of us feel that that's the case, but actually seeing that as a, as a, a statistic, I think is, is pretty powerful. And I think one of the things, particularly um, as, as the fitness sector, and I really see that the fitness sector has united over this, over this crisis. And I, I am so, um, 
I'm so grateful for all of the all of the information sharing and all of the learnings that have that have happened through that synergy. But I think that the the t the takeaway for fitness is that we we have to remember that um, you know when if you go to the if you go to the perspective of the member who has uh, backslid a little bit on on progress and and really wants to start again but um, th there's a huge barrier for a lot of people who were very active before the crisis and even the people who weren't active at all but are now confronted more than ever about the state of their health because that's another question that we've we've asked them is how much more is your physical health important to you now versus before the crisis? Like there's just a real awareness uh, about that. And I think our role uh, as the fitness sector is to, is to really be uh, understanding of the fact that the barrier for a lot of people to come back to physical activity is higher than it was before the crisis. And at the same time, compounding that, there's an urgency within these people that knows that it's important. So I feel like we really need to, again, come together and, and make that uh, barrier disappear for people to, to become active again, to, to make it uh, gentle and easy and uh, create um, a success uh, feeling for people to, to start again, rather than the confrontation of they were active, but now they're not again, because it's more important than ever to, to do what you can to take it, the, the positive aspects of your health into your own hands. Great. Well, I'm wondering, Jennifer, I don't know if you can see if there's any questions or... There are three questions. Um, and I also have a question for you. So there are four questions. Uh, this, oh, Adam Campbell is, is responsible for all three of our questions. Way to go, Adam. Uh, he says a lot of talk about building, uh, building back better post pandemic. Uh, what did the panelists? So this is a question for all of you. What did the panelists see as two or three key opportunities for the operators or the industry to be better? to be better post-crisis? Uh, I, I suppose I can, I can kick off with that um, for two. Um, and I think I would expect, and Jed, if you might be able to correct me on this, this is the same for a European perspective. I think from a, from a data and insight perspective, um, we can improve significantly on that. One, to truly show the impact both economically, but also from a social value perspective. And I think that will inform business decision moving forward. And what's been apparent, and again, this is anecdotally across um, markets that have been able to open quicker than, than some others, is the understanding of how that industry fits in with the health service. Mm. And I think in order to do that is that solidifying clear standards in the UK, it's looking at the workforce with regards to SimSphere, it's looking at us from an operational perspective, um, but making sure that, again, that coherent voice um, can work with government to improve um, standards both in government size but also in consumer confidence yeah in consumer size mm. what are your thoughts jennifer oh, oh I, i'm going to uh, <laughs> i thought i was gonna turn it over to the rest of you because i've just uh, spoken a lot I, I let's let's go to Miguel and uh and then alan um uh thank you jennifer uh i think that uh, uh to 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 your question adam is um uh, i think it's uh data Data, it's uh, very important. I mean, data. So that's why I was making them put an emphasis on the digital. It's about going to your customer instead of the customer coming to you. So it's like you don't wait for the boat to come to the harbor. You have to swim to the boat. So you have to go to their places, to the anywhere, to the outdoors. So data. And I think it's a, it's a, to accumulate data about your your I think about the during this crisis there are restaurants here in Spain that even though they were closed locked down I mean they were doing a reasonable amount of business because they knew their customers how many customers go into restaurants and they just know the person if they pay attention to the person who's paying but nothing about the person the the other people that are around the table and we're missing lots of opportunities so 
data, 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 and get to know your customer, as Jennifer was saying. And then based on what uh, Alan shared with all of you, I think it's leading yourself. Leading so yourself first and then lead the team and lead the business. That was a, a CEO of Novartis. You know, that's a very a big pharma company. They say, lead yourself first, lead your team, and then lead the business. So, I mean, we are the most difficult, challenging people to, to person to lead, you know, think about it. When we are good with ourselves and it's easy to lead the team, you know, but if not, how are we gonna be leading somebody if we are not able to lead ourselves? So that's, uh, that, that would be something that, you know, I, I, I came reinforce uh, uh, about during this uh, pandemic thing. And, and certainly, you know, the purpose that, you know, uh, Alan was talking about is I think it's a very strong concept to work on. Alan? Oh, if, if I, uh, I would, uh, just so what, what Mikhail said about the leadership piece, um, uh, maybe just to underline three words that were in my earlier piece about acknowledging uh, yourself um, exactly as it is, uh, embracing, and that means loving yourself for the, where you are, uh, because it is fantastic and it can be fantastic point, and it, exploiting that correctly with the correct allocation. So I think, uh, and this would go to any company, any sector, uh, leadership uh, effectiveness uh, through understanding self and others in your team can always go up. Then the thought about building better uh, for the future, just taking that theme, I think there's also an opportunity to say, well, do we really know uh, fundamentally who in fact is it's the, the different uh, customer types that we have? So we're talking about customer centricity uh, as a subset of people centricity, then understanding them um, and then tailor fitting the way of interaction that comes from the organizations to them, whether uh, you know that be um, uh, one-to-one -one virtual or one small group virtual or a certain group of friends virtual or when people do come back in, into the clubs. And, and secondly, from a, a people sensitive point of view, understanding each and every one of your, your employees and then deploying them. So it might be that some will be particularly well suited to, to have virtual one-to-one -one sessions, really, or one to small groups. Uh, others will be perhaps more suited and better suited to if you get back to the large spinning classics uh, with, with multiple people in, in the room to do the, the, the motivational rah-rah piece. Uh, uh, and, and I can imagine exactly where they're served by factor one right, but the, the second, the first one I talked about there, uh, really uh, more people related, understanding, caring, empathetic, small small group uh, interaction would be great. So I'd, I'd suggest that as a taking that knowledge of fundamental human characteristics throughout your entire organization and customer base. Thank you very much. I, I, in, in getting inspired from your answers, I, I have uh, two additions. One is from Mikhail's presentation. I think we should stop saying the word customer and start saying the word people. Customer seems so distant. It's like uh, talking about others rather than talking about us. I, I think we need to, to bring it closer because in the end, it's all about people, 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 uh, all the way around. Uh, and one of the things that we did um, I, at the end of last year uh, in, in my team, I, I work uh, with a multidisciplinary team of people that I borrow from other departments. And we got uh, training on the agile way of working. And one of the things that I loved in the discipline of that system is at the end of every project, you, you, you do a retrospective. So it's just a reflection on what went well, what were the challenges, what can we bring forward. I really think we need to have as a, as a sector, a <laughs> retrospective on, on the crisis, because I think there's a lot of things that we can uh, apply and move forward forward to help us to progress for the future. Um, second question from Adam Campbell. We have seen significant shift away from heroic leadership. So I think let's start with Alan for, the, uh, for this uh, question. Uh, <coughs> heroic leadership towards servant leadership. What personal challenges does Alan see experienced leaders having to overcome and lead in a new, more comp compassionate way? Well, um, it, it's all 
slightly subject to interpretation of uh, what is meant by heroic leadership. If I, if, if I take an interpretation, I would say that people who typically present that way will have a, a certain combination of fundamental human characteristics. So they will typically, just by nature, be naturally quite outgoing, naturally quite uh, dominant, naturally quite wanting to take the lead and, and promote. And usually there's a, there's a high level of fact, fact focus and, and rationality. There can be a, a, a mixture of, uh, let's say, energy running about it and the, the calm steadiness or the, the heroic figure, you know, the, the sword kind of thing. So if, if that is <coughs> your fundamental practice and makeup, it's no surprising then you might therefore uh, present and act as what we can loosely call heroic. So, so it's, it's a challenge then for, for some of that fundamental practice to move into servant or maybe differently put in service of. Uh, so in service of uh, would be helped by someone who, who would be genuinely um, uh, listening, uh, considerate, caring, uh, wanting to make sure people are well and well looked after. And therefore the service mentality attitude comes, comes naturally to them. There's, there's a high level of, of collaboration there. Uh, service also usually implies a concession and compromise and, and maintaining a, a, a social harmony that, that somehow is, is there. So you're, you're putting others first. And putting others first is, is, is helped by, you know, using language factor too, right? Um, now, if, if the person has the traits that lead them more into the heroic thing, then they've got some self-reflection to do. Um, is it possible with the awareness to say, okay, with that awareness, can I consciously dial, dial it up? Can I consciously dial down and do more off? Or do I need to partner with someone who can uh, help me do it effectively? Uh, or, or maybe I delegate some of it to the extent it could be delegated. So it's really just the, the question is knowing who I am and knowing what the need is and the developing need is, uh, am I going to help myself or hinder myself? And to the extent of hinder, what can I do about it tactically? Uh, there may be other aspects of your personality you can call out that can help. So, so again, moving to in-service is, is, is primarily supported by a particular combination of uh, human characteristics. Great. Mikael, do you have anything to add? Um, uh, yeah, based, based on your comments, um, um, to your point, Jennifer, and to the point that Stephen made, I would like to make a couple of comments. One, uh, when you're talking about the agile and this uh, doing that re retrospective about every project, I think that one thing that we have a tremendous opportunity is to do the lessons, lessons learned process. I mean, it's a unique opportunity. <laughs> I mean, we, we didn't ask for it, but it came. And experts say, Warren Buffett says that uh, one of the worst things we can do in crisis is not to take advantage of it. So I think it's a great, uh, I invite all the groups, you know, and, and yourself to sit down one day, a couple of hours, what did we learn? What did we learn? What should have been done better? And what we're gonna be doing from that? But this learning, it, we, I think that we have, uh, uh, we have been participating in the uh, in the most intense global uh, education program in the world, you know, for these three months. And maybe some of us we are still there. So it's learning. I mean, it's reflecting. Stop and doing that retrospective. I think it's a great asset we have. So thanks, uh, Jennifer, for mentioning that. Then another point that Jennifer made was about the CEO meeting very frequently with people in crisis. We need to talk very often. When it's a uh, you know peaceful time, and we we can see each other maybe once a week, but now crisis. It's I mean it's like we've been training to do the game, this game good. So all we've done in the past been training, passable, but now it's the final. So you know this uh, talk to your people more and more frequent, and because uh, we need to be connected very much. And then the point about uh, Stephen Scales made a, a point about that I. I could not agree more. It's not about share builder. It's not about stealing customers or people from others. It's about category builder. I mean, we have an opportunity to make people more active, you know, yeah, using the, the word that you're using in your logo. So let's go for that. I mean, 
let's let's go be a category builder and as i said then let's not talk about the company and let's talk about the sector let's talk about the country let's talk about the world we have here the power as uh, you know uh, the, of influencing you know many people you know to be more healthy and more active so let's go all together for that pretty much thank you I've got I've got the last question from Adam. I'm going to direct it uh, at Stephen. Um, what has uh, Europe Active and in this case UK Active learned through the crisis about the needs of its customers? So, uh, I suppose I can answer it in in two ways, really. I suppose the customers is in our members, um, yeah. and I wouldn't say oh, sorry, people. People, <laughs> people, um, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Meant, meant to note. Um, I, I suppose. It's reinforcing a value that we've had a lot of the time is that it's a, it's a line that I use an awful lot is that UK Active isn't the employees of UK Active, it's a member organization. Um, so throughout this process is I think it's people learning that we are all together. Um, so and we have the ability that through being open and honest and sharing successes as well as sharing some real sensitive challenges, we can really progress the agenda. Um, and I think historically in pockets, we've probably done that. However, I think that lies the potential for the future that if we can continue this level of um, coherence and trust in, 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 in the sector, I think we can really begin to, to build on that. And that's certainly the case from a from UK active um, perspective is that we are one in the same and the bigger that we collectively get, the more that people, not customers, um, will um, respond to being active. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Andreas, do you have anything to add from uh, the Europe, Europe Active perspective? Yeah, I would like to, um, sh should I perhaps wrap, wrap up afterwards, uh, Jennifer, just to, uh, yeah. after, after answering this question? Okay, great. Just being mindful of the of the time. Um, just picking up on what, what Steve said, um, when COVID-19 happened, the first thing we did at Europe Active was to, was to reach out to all of our different stakeholder groups and create um, online roundtables and consult the industry across stakeholder groups, really sort of being mindful of, uh, of us wanting to be representatives so or representing the sector and, and really sort of you know, um, celebrating with the sector when things are great and also suffering a little bit with the sector when things are challenging and, uh, and really connecting with the sector and listening to the sector. So we've, we've spent a lot of time doing that and we have established some of these fora as permanent institutions or, or, or fora of your, your, your active um, going forward. So we make sure that we keep that connection um, and, uh, and, and that consultation, constant cons consultation with the industry. That's extremely important. And I think it's a matter of um, rep representativeness, as I said, uh, being a legitimate, uh, the legitimate uh, industry body uh, of the sector. But, uh, but also it's a matter of um, responsibility and um, who, are you, who, who are you responsible to as an industry representative, whether being a, a commercial leader, leader or leader of a, an industry association. And um, I was very happy that, that Alan uh, spoke about Viktor Frankl, that we... Uh, geeked around about in, in Madrid last uh, fall, because I would say from, for me personally, the most important leadership book that there is, and I know this is a bit controversial, but, but that's Viktor Frankl's uh, Man's Search for Meaning, because fundamentally life privately and uh, professionally is, I believe, a matter of, of, of meeting, meaning and finding that meaningful journey in life professionally and, and privately. And uh, Viktor Frankl, Frankl specifically says that that meaning comes from responsibility, feeling responsible for something. And the, the very word of, of, of responsibility, of course, of course, means response, that you can respond meaningfully to why you did as you did. You know, so, so fundamentally, a, a question of mindfulness and being, being mindful of why you, you made the different, different decisions that you did. And in order to do that, of course, you need to think and be aware and be mindful. So take good decisions and, and think critically before you execute. Um, and, and I think for, for Europe Active uh, and for Dave's and my leadership uh, uh, going through this crisis with the Europe Active team, uh, who I'm so grateful for their the, the commitment and, and, uh, and, and being on this common journey 
with us, including the year back to board, of course. But you know, it, it has been very much about creating the common journey, creating that narrative that will keep us afloat and flying through this uh, thunderstorm. And and that has been very much about what what our primary purpose as an, as a, as a sector association, what that is. And of course, uh, more than anything, that's about representing the sector. But also, if you, if we look at the end user, it's about empowering uh, communities and empowering city citizens across Europe through physical, mental, and social um, well-being. Um, that's actually um, a bit of a that is you know in, um, some of the, the thinking of of your of UK Active's former uh, CEO Stephen Ward has inspired us in that re that regard. He spoke a lot about or he speaks a lot about creating happier, healthier communities. And, and you know, um, thinking about our sector's wider responsibility to create happier, healthier, healthier communities. And we have, we have, um, we have been, been inspired at Euro Euro Active quite a lot in that regard, um, speaking about wanting to empower uh, communities for, through physical, social, and, and, and mental well-being. And that creates, creates a sense of responsibility and purpose that has been very strong um, and, and very important for us uh, while uh, moving and working through this uh, crisis over the past couple of months. Um, so with that, I would just like to say that, as I said in the beginning, uh, we're working with, with UK Active to, uh, to create um, a future leadership program in collaboration with IEC Business School and um, some of the experts that you've met on, on this panel. And, and we'll come, up, come back with much more uh, information about that as, uh, as, uh, as, we, as the different details will be, um, will be uh, ready for, um, for um, for, to be published. Um, just a few words about our coming uh, year back to webinars. Uh, we have a very um, interesting webinar tomorrow about um, effective uh, programming for personal trainers. It will be led by Julian Berriman and some of his um, experts from across uh, the European industry. And, uh, and next Wednesday, we have a webinar on medical fitness and exercise is medicine, how we, um, how we, um, as an industry become that uh, essential provider of physical, social, mental, mental well-being and how we collaborate with uh, public and private healthcare. Though that's on Wednesday, uh, the 8th of July. Thanks so much everyone for joining us and thanks uh, first and foremost uh, to our panelists, our two uh, experts from AC Business School, Alan and Miguel, thanks so much for um, enlightening us and to our two Industry representatives Jennifer and, and Steve, thanks so much for your brilliant leadership and uh, for uh, putting this together for us today. Any final words, Jennifer, or was that it? No, that was fantastic. All right. <laughs> thanks so much. See you next time. Bye. 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 Bye.